I don't know if you know me. Uh, I've been mostly known, I think, in the airline community. I'm new to Elixir in here, so I'm doing a bit what of uh, Osa mentioned yesterday, which is go and uh, advertise your stuff in conferences and languages that you don't have anything to do with. Uh, and I'm doing this with Elixir. Uh, more frankly, it's because I think, yeah, hello, microphone. Um, yeah. This is cool. It feels like being a rock star. So I'm thinking next year it should be done in a dojo. So then you can feel like a code ninja and you've done all the hipster stuff. Uh, but yeah, you might know me for Learn Use from Erlang for Great Good, Erlang and Anger. I recently wrote propertesting.com. Uh, I have a blog where I have opinions. Uh, and I'm also the maintainer of Rebar 3. So Elixir people having issues with mixed builds, that's probably where you know me the most. Uh, and if you have never heard of me before, uh, my latest project was being on a t-shirt for this conference. Uh, I'm a systems architect at a company called Genetech. And uh, this is a bit how I represent myself and my job. Uh, really, my whole thing is making broad plans. And if they go well, I take all the credit. And if they go wrong, I blame the developers uh, for not executing well on my previous vision. Uh, more specifically, uh, Genetech is a kind of company where we do uh, security systems, sur uh, video surveillance, license plate reading, access control with like badges and cards to read. And uh, there's something interesting in that it's deployed in all kinds of environments, mom and pop shops, coffee shops, uh, department stores. Uh, we have it even uh, in train stations, airports, or citywide surveillance systems. And there's something quite interesting about that uh, because it's closer to the older, older model of doing things where people have their own installations, you ship them software, and they have to do the upgrades and you don't even have access to the machines where it happens. Uh, I used to work in cloud stuff and now this is all kinds of new, but there's a very fun challenge in that if your software crashes, the people taking over for it is uh, someone that needs to fly out for seven hours to get on site. And otherwise, it's uh, military dudes with submachine guns taking over the system. So uh, you don't want that to happen, and you try for that not to happen. And that's kind of my job as a systems architect, is coming up with broad principles that will prevent these issues from ever taking place. Um, and hopefully they do, but without crushing the hopes and dreams of the developers we have and doing a kind of technical micromanagement. So a few of the plans survive the whiteboard. They kind of die early. Uh, but that's really where I come in in there. Um, yeah, I even have the clothing right. So um, what I found out as being a systems architect, and this is mostly a C-sharp a, a, a place with a lot of Windows computers, but we're introducing Erlang in there, is that all the things that I do related to systems architectures and that kind of stuff to make reliable, reliable systems uh, in the fields and areas we don't control, I end up always coming back to the vocabulary that OTP and Erlang gives us. And I wanted to present a bit of that today and how um, we can approach making reliable system when we don't know what the hell is going to go wrong with it. And so the way I like to describe it is based on the areas of knowledge we have. And so there's a little brown orange circle in there. Those are the things that we know. Uh, we know a bunch of stuff that is not related to code. We understand a part of the code. Most of the code, we don't even know what it is. Uh, it's going to be stuff in the operating system. You're in charge of that if you ship a product. Uh, hypervisors if you're in the cloud, the rest of the libraries, the virtual machine. This is technically all your responsibility, and most of us know only a tiny portion of it, and that's what we ship, and that's what we trust, and that's the area we know. Uh, fortunately, the overlap with the bug sections in there uh, is interesting, uh, because the bugs about the things we know are super easy to handle. There are going to be things like the bugs you have found in QA before shipping something if you have a QA process. Uh, but you decide, you know what, we don't have the time, we don't have the budget, we're going to ship a buggy system to hell with it. Uh, but usually those are easy to fix because you understand the system, you understand uh, the code that goes around in there. If there is a problem, it's easy to figure it out. It's probably related to a to-do someone left with bad error handling somewhere, and you just shipped it with a to-do, went through code review, and then it bites you in the ass. It's like, oh yeah, I know how to fix that. And then you just remove the to-do and you pretend it's fine. Uh, <laughs> And then the other more dangerous area is, just, is the stuff you think you know, the little purple circle in there. This is the stuff where uh, you think you understand something, you have a mental model of how it works. You have no proof, but you're pretty sure yourself. And yesterday I think Rob had the thing like, are you sure about wanting to ship that? And the things you think you know tells you, yes, I'm sure. I'm sure of it. You know you're wrong when they're asking you, like, do you have any proof or metrics for that? You're like, I don't, but I know. 
And that's the things you think you know. You're not actually certain they're going to be there. In a system, these errors are kind of really, really tricky. Uh, if they're on top of the system, something late, like you didn't know your logging system would be truncating log lines, it's not that bad. It's easy to fix. It's easy to turn around. But if the Jenga tower of software that we have built has the assumptions in the wrong place, uh, for example, you assume that all the tests you did on the loopback interface on local hosts uh, was representative of the deployment in the field, which is entirely untrue. The TCP stack doesn't work the same at all if you do it on the loopback interface and if you do it with an external computer, then all your error handling and error detection and connections is going to be screwed. And so if you do that at the very basic of your system, you have shipped a system that just plain doesn't work, uh, which is still a way to make money, I guess, uh, but ideally you don't do that. And then there's the stuff that is not in any circle, the things that we don't know in the known universe. You cannot prepare for these bugs or these kinds of issues because you don't even know they are a thing. Uh, I think the best example we've had recently was the meltdown bug. All the security measures are kind of useless because people are able to read whatever memory they want and do whatever the hell they want. Uh, another one that I like a whole lot is the thundering herd problem where if you have a server that is kind of centralized and you have a bunch of clients trying to connect to it and send data to it, and uh, they, the, the server dies and comes back up, all the clients rush and try to send data at once, it's just like a de denial of service attack and it kills the server back and back again. And if you have that in a production system and you are not ready for it, you're kind of screwed. You have to find exceptional means to make everything work again. Um, and those you just can't prepare for. And it's my favorite uh, category in all of these because the moment I tell about a bug, it's no longer valid as an example. Um, so the bugs that we have in there are in these categories. So the stuff you know is, should be easy to fix. Uh, you have all the knowledge you need. The things that you think you know, it's kind of hard. You have to be careful. You have to do some exploration, measuring, and it's kind of fine. And then the stuff you don't know, uh, you have to dig, gain knowledge, and possibly prayer is a solution to these. Uh, but the general approach I see in a system is how do we shift the bugs to the easy category? If we can have a kind of method by which we reduce all the unknown stuff to stuff that we know how to handle even though we don't know what it is, uh, things get a lot easier. And so the development practices uh, that we have there, some are going to be valid in any languages, and some are only available to us in like Erlang and Elixir, and I want to talk about them. So the easiest way to do it is to in, in increase the knowledge that you have in your team. Uh, yeah, this is actually a real complaint I have. Uh, why the hell are all the Elixir questions on Stack Overflow also tagged Erlang? Uh, but yeah, you have to increase the knowledge. And the first way to do that uh, is hire more senior developers, get good. Uh, it, it's not a really constructive one. Uh, senior developers are a real solution for that just because they're going to take that little orange circle and make it a lot bigger, and it's going to be great. Um, but the problem you have is that if you have your senior developers, they work on a feature for a year and a half, and then they get the hell out, you still have the code to maintain, and nobody knows how the hell it works. And so you have to use or uh, make yeah, efficient usage of your senior folks and that usually will be done through uh, fostering a good culture of mentoring, education, and communication within your teams. Um, it, it's not a sign of healthy teams is all, if all the inputs is senior people and all the outputs is other senior people. You have a healthy team if what you have as an input is junior people and your output is senior people getting poached left and right. Like, it's a happy thing if all you get stolen from you are senior people and you don't hire them in the first place. You're able to produce as many as you need. Um, and, and so what's going to be interesting about that is that you're going to need fewer of these senior people to do the stuff in your team, and they're going to be able to help you increase the knowledge of everyone you have in there. But a more important thing is about who you pick to be uh, on your team in the first place. And uh, this is where uh, diversity, I think, is interesting. So the thing that happens is that if all you have with you are other people who have the exact same background as you, I went to the same schools, lived in the same neighborhood all the time. You have the same hobbies and passions. You, the things you know circles for the entire team you have is probably the same for everyone on the team. And so uh, everyone's most likely to have the same blind spots. If you have people that come from different technical backgrounds, uh, different disciplines, different uh, economic or social areas, you're going to have a much greater coverage of all the areas you have in your team. 
And uh, what's going to happen for that, if I want to put it into a principle otherwise, is that if you hire a team full of people who really, really enjoy Bitcoin, you're pretty sure you're going to get a blockchain in your system, no matter what the system is. <laughs> Uh, and it's the same thing for distributed systems. Distributed systems engineers love doing that stuff. It's just like, I need a single machine. It's like, what if we put Paxos on there? <laughs> I have a Raft implementation in Elixir. It's going to be great. And uh, <laughs> you put all of that stuff in there, and you get that kind of problem going. If you have a more diverse team, and you know you've, got, you've done that if you had to do internationalization, and you have only English dude on your teams who have never spoken another language, you're going to hurt your foot on the corner of some door every five minutes. If you have people who have that different perspective, they prevent all the bugs just by being there and calling out the stuff that they know because they have a different background than you do. And so that's one of the best ways to increase knowledge in your system. And what's interesting is that they increase the knowledge in all the areas not necessarily related to code, which means it fixes future bugs and features you haven't even developed yet. It's an investment in the future you have on your team. If you do that, it's extremely worthwhile. Uh, uh, and yeah, I mean, it's one thing. Uh, and if you're really building products, uh, we have to be aware of that as well, just from the point of view that mostly everyone who works in tech is pretty educated, pretty literate. And so it's easy to forget, for example, that 15 to 20 percent of people in North America are functionally illiterate and not able to extract meaningful information from a text. And so if you have a product that you build and it's just like read the manual, and 20 percent of the people in your target audience don't know how to read a manual, you're kind of screwed. You're going to have a very bad support, well, a very, very bad time in your support team. So that's increasing knowledge overall. Uh, the other one that I like is exploratory testing, and I freaking love this painting. Uh, yeah, it worked on my machine. Back up your email, let's go into production. Uh, so exploratory testing is the practice where you take uh, an experienced manual tester, if you still have that, you sit them in front of the system, and you let them go hog wild. It's like just do stuff and note it down. Tell me what it can do, what it cannot do. And really, it's gonna f th these people are going to find a crap load of bugs. Uh, and it's going to be super great. The problem is that this is a kind of expensive way of doing it. It's time consuming. It's hard to do regressions. And we have kind of mechanical ways of doing that. And one of them is really um, to simply use uh, fuzzing. If you've ever used fuzzing, it's interesting. If you, the, the, the most known tool for that is American Fuzzy Lop. It expects you to compile a program, put some kind of uh, annotations in there that guides it about where it's going, and it's just going to generate garbage to throw at your program. And so it might be something like, maybe to create a crash, it's going to require 5,000 Ws that are capital, followed by binary garbage. And after a couple of days, it might figure that out and tell you how it crashes your program. And so fuzzing is really, really great to throw all the garbage you can and figure out, can it still run through the garbage, or is it dying in there? Um, one thing that we have in the Erlang and Elixir communities uh, that is kind of related to that is property-based testing, where instead of just throwing garbage at a program to see if it crashes, we throw garbage at a program and check if it still does the right thing. We've got a few examples of that, and frankly, we've got great tools for it uh, with uh, QuickCheck, which is probably the best thing you can have in the system for that. Uh, you've got proper, that's pretty interesting, trick that is kind of dead, uh, and you've got stream data, but stream data doesn't necessarily do the fanciest stuff. But if you can use property-based testing, it's uh, absolutely great for that. So the big interesting stuff in property-based testing is in stateful testing. And it's going to be basically equivalent to having that kind of um, exploratory testing done by someone, but you're automating it in code. So instead of just generating data and saying, like, I have an image hosting service, can I generate usernames that are really funky and break the database? Uh, what you're going to generate with these stateful tests is going to be, uh, instead of a data structure, you're going to generate a sequence of operations. So it might be something like log my user in, log my user out, upload an image, view an image, and delete an image. And you might have properties or rules that are going to be like, a user cannot upload duplicate images. A user can only see the images that they have themselves uploaded, and you need to be logged in to upload an image. And you're going to run sequences of operations at random that are going to be something like log in, log out, upload, uh, upload the image, get the image, upload another image, delete the image, upload the image. And maybe after 24 or 40 of these operations, it's going to find a bug. And then you're going to have that complex sequence of operation from A to G that's going to be really complex, like 
How the hell is this a bug? And what property-based testing does is that it takes that sequence of operations and removes all of those that it can while still reproducing the bug. And it's possible that what you're left with at the end is going to be a sequence of login, upload an image, delete the image, and re-upload it again. And oh, surprise, you're not allowed to re-upload an image that you deleted because the checking is done wrong for the duplicates. Then you might not have thought of doing that, but the computer is able to do it for you. And uh, it doesn't make us smarter. It just makes us better at understanding the programs. And all these practices, what they do is they really increase our areas of knowledge in the blue arrows in there and uh, make it easier. So the approaches that you have that are a bit more social for the team help you with all the areas overall. And the mechanical testing and whatnot really helps you within the code. And, and that turns out to be critical uh, because if you don't have code, you don't have bugs, which is why writing code sucks. Um, but yeah. One thing that you hope happens, though, is that as, you te as your team keeps gaining more and more knowledge uh, and the little brown-orange circle grows, you hope that the purple one stays fixed. Uh, what you don't want to happen is that everyone's like, we're so much smarter than we were before. We've got a great team, and then you make even more assumptions than before, and then you get screwed. Ideally, uh, you kind of learn from all the mistakes you made not to trust yourself and to... Uh, yeah, verify your assumptions before you do, and hopefully the things you think you know uh, are shrinking proportionally to what you know. The other really interesting and easy way to do things is just to decrease the stuff that you know nothing about. And the easiest way to do that is to just write less code. Don't write the code in the first place. You're not going to have the problems. Uh, if you can, you've got as well the uh, formal proof assistance, uh, all the formal methods of writing software that make sure that nothing can happen that you haven't planned for and prove that it wouldn't happen, and those are great. Uh, but w for what is about Erlang and Elixir, what we really have that's going to be interesting is going to be use dialyzer. It's going to prevent all kinds of weird states that you had not planned could be there. It's going to prevent you from getting in there. Use linters, code for matters. We've had talks about that already. They make stuff clearer. Uh, it's harder to have bugs and things that are clear and easy to understand. Uh, if you do have formal methods and the time and budget and knowledge to do it, do use it. It's working by all means. Uh, the other trick is let it crash. And let it crash, I think everyone here is kind of aware of that, but it's kind of really, really critical. If you do the approach of what um, I like a whole lot, I like to hate a whole lot in Golang, which is just you check the errors by hand and you forget one of them, you enter really quickly into that kind of garbage area of your code where uh, the input that you had and you, can you kind of messaged into working uh, no longer is what the user expected nor the system expected, and then you, get, you give free range to the system to have emergent behaviors that causes surprising bugs that nobody thought could be there. If you fail early and you fail often, you prevent all these unknown states, and things go much, much better. Uh, the other thing that's super interesting in there is to have an observable system. And observability has been thrown around uh, quite a few times these last few years in the operation circles. And the reason I'm saying that is that the worst bugs are in things you think you know and in the things that you don't know. Uh, which means that in practice, you are not going to have logs or metrics about these areas. If you know they were risky, you would probably have explored them and prevented the hard bugs from being there. So whatever issue you have that's really, really tricky, you're not going to have metrics or logs. And if you're working with airports or cities like we do, it might be two years before they've deployed the next version of your software, and so you don't have anything to debug it. And so it's really critical when we work on the Erlang virtual machine to be aware of all the nice features we have for that. Uh, that will include tracing. They will include all the metrics, the system debug information. Uh, the memory layout that we can explore, all of that stuff is gold. Because when you have one of these tricky bugs, instead of spending a cycle of three weeks to a month of deploys to add metrics and then come over logs like an idiot doing all of that, you just log onto the machine, you check the thing, you trace it, and in 15 minutes you have an answer. So you really want to learn all about that stuff because that's what makes the difference between uh, losing a month of work and just doing it directly. I, I care enough about that that I've written Erlang in Anger for that reason. And then the other one, I just like this painting a whole lot with uh, the little caption. It's not really related to anything, but I like the dirty look they give. That's how I feel whenever I go in a lunch area and you sit right next to the marketing folks. It's like, what are you nerd doing here? Uh, 
So yeah, the trick is making things irrelevant, which is the feeling you have when you sit right next to the marketing people. And usually you do that through architecture. Architecture is one of the best examples for that. If you have redundancy, you have more than one server, it doesn't matter why the other dies. You don't have to know if it's about hardware, if it's about a really critical bug or something like that. It doesn't matter. You took an external means to say all these categories of errors that result in a crash, I handle them without knowing what they are. So fail, fa fail fast and fail often is great for that. Um, and this is gonna be valid in all languages. What's really interesting is that in Erlang and Elixir, specifically with OTP, we have access to these architectural patterns that most languages only have when you're dealing with hardware machines or virtual machines and not within the language itself. And so who here is really familiar with supervisors and how they work? All right, there, there, there's still a few hands who were not raised. Either you are hungover from yesterday or you don't know about it, so I'm gonna go over stuff. Uh, there's gonna be supervisors, and supervisors are just three means really to get through them. There's a one-for-one one supervisor, that's the basic one, where if a process dies, it's the only one that dies, it gets restarted, and off you go, it's great. There's a rest-for-one supervisor, and the rest-for-one supervisor is pretty fantastic, nobody uses it, but it denotes a linear dependency between components. Uh, and that means that if uh, process C on the right depends on the one and B, and B depends on A, you put that supervisor in there, and if one of them dies, all the other that comes after are going to be restarted. And it's a great, great pattern for all these linear dependencies. And then you get one for all, and one for all is gonna be when all your processes kind of interact with each other. And if one of them dies, it's really tricky, and it's a garbage task to try to repair the state to know like there's gonna be a new one coming. You have to reset, cancel what you are doing, go back to an on state, it's like, forget about that, just kill everything and bring it back up, it's much simpler to reason about. That's when you use one for all. And then there's the way to deal with loss. Permanent supervisor uh, restarts all the time. Transient ones uh, only restart on an abnormal exit. So if something failed accidentally, that's when you restart. Otherwise, it's like the task is done, it's great. And temporary supervision, initially, most people are just like, why do I need that? I just need not to put it in a supervisor. Uh, but there's a great reason to do it uh, and I get down in there. And this is the part where it's really becoming uh, a, a bit like a whiteboard sessions. And this is how I design, personally, all the Erlang systems I work with. And I think more people should do it. Uh, I think I heard at some point Joe Armstrong say that he never has more than two layers of supervisions in a system. I'm like, this is crazy. I never have only two layers of supervision. And so I I'm trying to sell you on this technique right there. So let's assume I have this system. It's a very fancy one. It has tiny local storage. Uh, in, in the cylinder right there. There's an IP device, it could be a camera, it could be an escalator, it could be an HTTP server that you just route traffic to. And then on the left you have like the inputs. You've got DBs and queues, and that's where you put orders that go into that system. And you've got the root supervisor at the top. And how do you build a system before having written any code? Well, I'm gonna need something to talk with the databases and the queues and the storage and all of that. And so I'm gonna call that the report supervisor or something, or to put it on the left. That's the first thing I wanna boot in my system. Supervisors always start from the leftmost, leftmost child depth first synchronously, and that is great. So I will need to talk to the SQL database, probably Postgres. I'm gonna start a supervisor for a work pool in there. Woo. And um, once the work pool is started, all the workers are there, they're connected. Once the connection is established, I'm ready to go connect to the queue. Maybe it's RabbitMQ, maybe it's Kafka, I'm gonna do the same thing. Now I know that my system, whatever I boot after that, is already ready to talk to these databases. They're gonna be available. So the next thing I'm gonna want to have is metrics, uh, because I want to know what's gonna happen, and the rest of my system is gonna need to be able to publish metrics, so I start a worker for that. Uh, then I'm gonna want a local configuration of a cache. If I'm deploying that a customer's side, the databases are, done, uh, are, are down, I still want the system to work. So I put that in a nets table, all a big copy of that, and I dump it to disk through a worker or something. And now if the databases go down, I should be able to have a, a system that works. And now I can start the things that pull or that communicate with the other devices. I'm setting up my configuration. I know that when I start this process, everything else is already set, ready, uh, to go, and so I have the database, I have the configuration, I can start my worker that talks to the IP device, and I can decide to make my own, of them, my own one there, and each one can be structured in a complex manner. It could be a little supervisor that itself has a state machine that maintains the state of what goes on within a connection, and the connection is another process that linked to it, and so if the connection breaks, I can still maintain my state or something like that, and that's how it goes, and so you have, yeah, a good system architecture, but honestly, this is boring garbage. 
I don't care how it works. I care how it works when everything is on fire. That's where the real challenge is. Making a system that works when everything is going great is easy. It's not that interesting. What I want to know is that, yeah, when stuff starts to fail and we've made mistakes, and the mistakes might be in code, might be in the environment, might be somewhere, how do we deal with that? Those are the true and expected errors. And the luck we have is that if we assume that we make mistakes all the time, it's much easier to plan for them. So really the big practice I do is I do my own chaos monkey on the whiteboard. I kill the worker on the left. If that worker dies, should the other workers right next to it also die? And the answer is no. So I'm going to put a one for one supervisor. I know I'm going to want the same thing in Kafka. Then I can have the question, if the SQL supervisor dies, maybe all of them are dead because the database is down. Do I want Kafka to die at the same time? Probably not. There's no reason why it should die with a database. So I'm going to as well put a one for one supervision in there. Now I can go work on the bottom right. It's like, what if the connection is broken to the device? What do I do? Do I want to drop the state in the state machine? If I'm having an HTTP proxy, then yes, maybe there's no way to save it. If what I'm having is a video feed and I'm just like broken because of a bad connection or something, I might want to keep it. And so I'm going to use a REST 4.1 pattern and I drop the link in between the two of them because if the connection breaks, I will know about it anyway. And it's all handled. And then you ask the same questions. What if one of the connection, one, one of the polars itself is broken? Do I want the others to die? And the answer is no. So it's probably a simple one for one supervisors because I could be having thousands of them. And so you repeat that process over and over again. And eventually you get into a tricky area. It's going to be what happens if I kill the entire subtree for databases? What do I do in there? Maybe the connection is broken on the entire left side. Those are on two different networks. That one is entirely unavailable. Everything exploded. Is it reasonable for me to want to keep interacting with my devices? Maybe I have a local configuration. What do I do with that one? What if that configuration worker dies? Should the other polar dies? How do I deal with my root supervisor on there? It's entirely at the top. Usually it's a one for one by default. So how do I patch this system? And really you don't need to patch it in code. You patch the supervision tree. And here's what you do. You had more layers of supervision. And so maybe the reporting side and the metrics are kind of tied together. I don't care what they are. I put them into a one for one supervision. They keep the same semantics. But what happens by doing that is that if the entire reporting side dies, the other side still lives because they're living in two different subtrees of the supervision structure. And so I have defined through the encoding of my code structure in there uh, that no matter what happens, I should be able to be working with my polars as long as I have my local configuration, it doesn't matter if the databases are not there. That's why at least the intent is on these. And so you can start the, exa the exercise again. It's like, what happens if my IP device that I'm connecting to is going haywire? It's garbage. It's not detecting lightning properly, and it's crashing all the time. Uh, what do I do with that? And so if it can die repeatedly multiple times a second, the risk I run if I have a standard supervision structure is that it's going to hit the maximum repeating rate and kill all the supervisors until the entire system goes down. And, and this is really a bad thing. I don't want a single worker to take down the entire system. That's the entire reason I'm using Erlang or Elixir is for that not to happen. So that's where you use really the temporary supervisors. The little supervisor that is right here with the thing, that one, uh, I give it a, 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 repeat, a repeated rate where it's going to be something like you can fail 10, 10 times a second. It doesn't matter if you break that, it shuts down. But that one, the supervisor for these polars right here, that one is temporary. And if that process dies, it vanishes. It's better to lose one device than to lose the entire thing. And so what you do is that you add a brain to the supervisor. You're going to see people advocating all the time for smarter supervisors with back offs in there and all that kind of stuff. I don't want any of that garbage. I want my supervisor to be as dumb as whatever you have in your house. If it's just a, a doorknob that you turn, you can trust a doorknob. It's so simple, you should be able to understand it. I want my supervisor to be so simple that I don't make mistakes about what I think it should do. I know what it does. And what I do is I have that little worker on the side that just acts as a brain. From time to time, it's going to scan the supervisor. They're like, do you have all the children you need? Compare that with the configuration file. And if someone is missing, it's like, oh, that one probably died violently. I can restart it in one minute. And then you try it. If the device recovers, the system recovers. You implement your backup to adding a brain on the side of the system. You don't make a smart system. Smart systems make stupid mistakes. Uh, yeah. And so what I have is that just going through that exercise, I have this new corrected supervision structure that now should be encoding all the things I need in my system to be fault tolerant 
and I have written zero code. And when I work with the teams uh, at Genetech, when we have new Erlang developers that have never written Erlang before, we do that before they even touch the code for their systems. We just do it on a whiteboard and they go like, I have absolutely 100% an idea of how I implement the system. The workers are simple to do. It's going to be a connection handler. It doesn't matter where you put it, but now you know how the system boot, you know how the system fails, and you know how it should be recovering. But of course, that's the nice picture in the sales pitch in the talk. Uh, it's not always going to work. Uh, you need to take measures to support your supervision tree and do the things that it needs to do. The basic principle there is to handle certainty. And um, the way to really do that one uh, is, um, I've written a blog post in the past called, it's about the guarantees. And what you want to think about is that if I have an error that is expected, for example, my database connection handler, is I, I, do I expect the connection to ever break? If the database is on the local host, then no, it should be there. And so if the database goes away, it's fine for the worker to die. But if I'm, I'm talking to a database that is in the cloud, then I should really expect the connection to break from time to time. And so if that is an expected condition that happens all the time, the worker for the database shouldn't die when this happens. It should be able to relay the information to the caller, and the caller then can decide how to handle that. If you choose a fail-fast manner uh, of dealing with all the errors, even the well-known ones, you take away the choice of the caller of the, of the one that depends on you from making a good decision for error handling. So you want to handle the unexpected by crashing, but what you know will happen, return it as a value. This is the OK and error tuple and all of that stuff. That's where you do it. And so what that means is that I don't make a local decision. I expected the connection to break, uh, but really the smart decision of what to do about that broken connection goes to the caller. And so you absolve yourself of the responsibility, you bring that up to the upper level, and then they decide if they want to crash or they want to handle it, and the worker is fine. And if you do that, you bring more support to your supervision tree. Uh, the other pattern is going to be dead letter queues, and I love this painting. This is, uh, I think, a bunch of uh, Mongol armies responding to the Ottoman Empire, but just insults. And uh, yeah, dear server, choke on that. Um, and so dead letter queues, if, especially if you have clients to which you cannot give information, uh, if you're using a queue like RabbitMQ or Kafka and you're just consuming stuff and you're expected to shut up and do it, there's going to be times where someone sends you wrong data. Either it's um, a bug in the client software, uh, it might be an operator with fat fingers that just broke something, or it might be that another part of the system is on a newer version of the software than you, what you are on right now. And this is one of the realities of distributed systems is that you cannot know what the future version is going to be, but you have to expect that it's going to run right next to you at some point. And so if you get that, it's possible you get messages you don't know how to handle. And the way to do that usually is that you're going to try a few times. If it doesn't work, you let somebody try to do it. And if you have a counter or something like it failed 10 times, you have to give up. Either you throw the request on the ground, or if you're using something critical, like I don't know, financial transactions, you need something called a dead letter queue. And the dead letter queue is you saying that my system is not smart enough to do this, I need to call an adult. It's going to put the thing in there, it's going to page someone, someone's going to look at the data as a stupid system, that's obvious, and then they're going to handle it for you. So dead letter queues is your system saying, I need an adult, but I don't need to stall entirely. There's going to be cases where you want to stall entirely. If what you're writing is a database and you need to replicate all the operation in order, by all means, don't drop a random one in the middle. You're just corrupting your one task. You had one thing to do, don't break it. Uh, but if you're really working with a kind of system with all kinds of uncertainty, then uh, usually an audit trail of the things you had to drop is worthwhile. And the last one is slowing down. Slowing down is something you want to do to exponential backups. I have mentioned the thundering herd a bit earlier. This is what you're planned for in there. When the system starts going wrong, you start to try again really rapidly at first, maybe every millisecond, and then you, you start thinking longer and longer time. Maybe it's going to be 10 minutes, half an hour later. It makes recovery slower for some clients, but it makes it so much easier for everyone involved. The thing to be careful about with that one is something similar to sympathetic resonance. You know that thing where all the military people walk on a bridge on the same beat and everything crashes and cr topples over? That happens with timers. If you put a timer to just back off from one second all the time, and they all start at different times, uh, as you get an even load on your system, you will get a, a little fun phenomenon by which uh, all the timers end up being synchronized even if they were not at the beginning. 
And so proper backoff libraries usually support a jitter mode where every one of the timer has a little variation that makes it unpredictable but means that they never get all synchronized. Uh, because otherwise, yes, you do totally get a thundering herd out of it again. And then you have circuit breakers. Circuit breakers are really, really cool in that uh, you can have metrics that are not failure to keep your stuff from working. If you're doing queries to a database or to a web service, you might be going and saying like, oh, uh, every time the, the query takes more than one second, this is getting a bit tricky. And if too many of them happen um, in a given period of time, you go, you know what, we're probably starting to kill the service right now. Cool off all the operations, stop calling the service, we're gonna try again in five seconds and see if it's better. And these circuit breakers are a kind of way to do it that is, uh, yeah, pretty interesting. It lets you regulate the system before it goes bad. Uh, it, I mean, it, it has the name of an electrical circuit breaker which is there to prevent you from burning your house down. So that, that's probably a, a well-chosen name. The other question is how do you know that your supervision tree is right? We have a structure we think is fine. We are designing systems to make sure that they kind of fit with what we have, but we don't know that we're actually doing it right. And so what I like for that is chaos engineering. This is the chaos monkey that you run at Netflix, uh, where it just kills random servers and sees what happens and whatnot. The interesting thing we have with the supervision tree is that instead of just being random servers in a cloud, we have a very strict structure of what we can do. And so we can have really good expectations that if I kill that worker, uh, I, should, uh, I kill that supervisor, all the workers should be dying, and unless I have hit a kind of rate limit here, the Kafka worker should be alive. And probably I can lose some of the workers I have here, but that supervisor for the polar fo should still be alive if I do expect the supervision tree to be different. So to test that, there's nothing cooler than property-based testing. And so I have a cool deal. I worked very hard on this slide. Um, and do I? Have a little demo. It's going to be Erlang codes. So yuck. Uh, <laughs> but this is what a bit property based testing looks like. It's, uh, I, I did that in a hurry. Uh, these two lines, eight and nine, it's just shutting up some of the logs because it's always very noisy. It's just crashing stuff repeatedly. Starts the application, runs some commands, and then outputs the stuff, and that's what it does. Uh, and this is how a state machine looks in the generation for them. I have a bunch of commands I can run. Here I only have one, two mark a process is dead. And I wrote a little library that takes a snapshot, a supervision tree, kills one at randoms, and then uh, shows you what it looks like. So, oh, that's not the right thing. I forgot to increase the text size. Let me do that. Actually, it's probably better if you don't have it at first. It's going to be tiny, tiny text, but I'm going to just show you uh, the kind of thing it does when it takes a snapshot of supervision tree. This is the 20th birthday of Erlang being open source, so I think it's apropos that I use a ter terrible terminal on Windows to test that stuff. Uh, yeah. So, find supervisor. It doesn't have type completions, great. And it generates really a big snapshot on the tree with that, with all kinds of annotations. I don't want us to actually look at that. It's pretty gnarly and terrible, let me just change the size. I'm eating on Sonny's time. It's going to be great. He's going to be glad about that. All right. And so uh, if I just run it as it is that way, it's not going to take us, it's not a very fast test suite because it needs to have to, but it's starting to see a bunch of failures. I'm killing stuff. That's normal. It's really noisy output. I haven't figured out how to make it silent and pretty. Uh, and Erlang stuff is rarely silent and pretty, I guess, so it's not that big of a deal. So it's going to run, and eventually what it's going to find in my little workers is uh, that this call here, when the DB worker dies too often, uh, this worker also suffers and explodes. And so maybe it has exploded. Oops. Yeah, it has exploded by now. It dumps the state. It's just like, I expected these children to be dead. They are not. There's a whole history that you have to come over that I have to figure out how to make readable, but phew, it works. And so you could just decide to go in here and catch the thing and make it work. Uh, the other approach that we can support with the tooling could be to uh, just tell it, for example, and I have the thing called there, yeah. Put a filter and say, I, I don't want to kill the database. Instead of doing that, what I expect to happen is that the database, uh, in case of troubles, it will not die, it will be disconnected. And so I have written that little thing where it filters a database. If it's not tagged as a database worker, you're free to kill it. If it's the database, I want from time to time to call uh, a mocking function that will return a function error disconnected. 
And so this is going to simulate a more realistic failure of what I have in my system. I'm gonna run it into there. And the system is running with a kind of small simulator that just makes it busy. And it, try, it, it should die really, really rapidly, and there you go. Uh, and if we look at some of the stack traces, which I know all of you find eminently readable, um, there's gonna be something like the bad match error disconnected, and I know that this is in my worker on line 20. I go into worker on line 20, and what I need to do is probably just change it to handle that kind of failure, because now I know that the database might happen to fail that way from time to time. So if I had, what was the result? It was just okay with nothing. Yeah. So if I have okay with whatever, uh, I just go, this is fine, and if I have the error disconnected, I'm gonna go, well, uh, retry it later or something. This is not a real value, nobody cares. And if we run that system again, now we should have the things where it's gonna take like five minutes to run the, the suite because at some point it has sequence of like 40 operations that need to propagate this. And now the only thing that shuts down is the application when it's done. We can leave it running and see what it does when we're done with it. But I'm, I'm doing chaos engineering on my thing. I don't need to deploy it in the cloud and, oh crap, that's not the right slide. It started from scratch. Let me get to the right place. Uh, what are these slides? I don't like PowerPoint all that much. I'm using it because that's a corporate template. Thanks to Genetech for sending me here. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so uh, in chaos engineering, we're running it right now. We don't need to deploy in production. We're doing fault injection, and the supervision structure lets us validate what, it, what is happening without knowing anything about my application. All I need to do at some places is make some, put some tags in the text that let me say, well, I don't want that process to die. I don't expect it to die. It should be right all the time, or if it dies, it doesn't die too often. You can make proper or quick check, go do something like, once in a while you kill that process, but most of the time you just simulate failures in there without killing it. And so you get that system that hopefully is super reliable. And what's interesting is what you can do now that you know you have that supervision tree that really represents the health of your system. And what I like to do with that is take the circuit breaker pattern and apply it directly to the entire system. So what you're doing, for example, is that all the stuff you depend on to boot, if it's a database, if you're writing financial transactions, for example, you might want to have an audit log. And if something doesn't get to the audit log, you're not allowed to do any kind of buying or something. If you're in ad tech, because there's a lot of people in ad tech, you know that if you are not able to track the, bu the, 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 the buys that you do for an advertisement, you don't want to do it because then you don't track the spend properly. So you might be going and boot your system and say, well, if the database is not there or my spend system is not there, I don't want the system to boot. I need that configuration to be there in the first place. If you're writing a router or a proxy, you might want to have like something like the firewall rules you're trying to implement before booting. If you boot a firewall without any firewall rules, you're probably doing a terrible job at being a firewall. So you can put that on the left side of the tree, you put your app in there, and it will ensure that all the required stuff is there before you start. And then on the other side, on the right, you can do all the stuff where you communicate the health of your system. If you're answering positively to a health check, or you are registering yourself to a kind of service mesh or discovery process, you can do it through the supervisor, and when the process dies, what you do is that you automatically unregister yourself. And what happens with that is by, through the encoding of your supervision tree, you are able to really encode in your system a way to register yourself to other dependencies and prevent other dependencies from being there. And as the system recovers, it automatically heals its status to the rest of the system. That's freaking cool. And yeah, you can then try to see how could you have, apply that pattern to other architectures. Uh, it, it works in Erlang, but it probably works in microservices. This is a diagram of um, uh, Cindy Schroederham, I think, copy construct on Medium from a previous job she was at. And this was a diagram of what uh, their microservices looked like. If you flip that image 90 degrees, it looks like a supervision tree. In most cloud systems that you're gonna have, it's just a list of nodes floating in the, in the void and they have to be there. What they don't have is the kind of dependencies that supervisors that you build. And here's a really, really simple system that I've seen in the past, is that two systems end up depending on each other in a chain where you don't know about it. And if the entire cloud goes down, you cannot boot it back up because over time you implemented a circular dependency. A supervision tree prevents that because it doesn't have cycles, for example. But how cool would it be that uh, if, B, if B is supposed to have data, you know automatically that A is not gonna register itself to receive traffic until there's some baseline level of health you need to serve requests. 
and this is what is really cool about applying these architectural patterns that are entirely local to your programs to a much uh, broader extent and context. And so that's a TLDR, uh, TLDL, not too long didn't listen. Uh, you can get it when I publish the slides. Image credits, it's mostly paintings. And uh, yeah, so that Genetech, we're hiring, but only like if you're in Montreal, Quebec City, or Sherbrooke. So uh, unless you plan on immigrating, uh, I don't think that there's a fat chance. But yeah, we're still open to people if you're looking to relocate to Quebec, the province. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.